Recording. Okay. okay. You are welcome. Very welcome, fellows. Uh, thank you very much for your interest and willingness to participate in the Eva Minerva SP conference. This morning we had 45 people following the opening conference, and the recording already has more than uh, two uh, two hundred uh, visualization in the YouTube. I think uh, uh, Terry Trickett for the organization and the coordination of this international session. Uh, in this session, we will have the technical and the operational support of Angela uh, from our Pro Reitoria and of Professor Eduardo Afonso from the Department of History, but from uh, UNESP. Uh, Professor uh, Andrea Dorini Rossi, uh, also. Uh, Professor Eduardo uh, will accompany the se session and will be available for any eventually. He is fluent in English and works in the area of cultural heritage and social memory. Have a great afternoon of the bats and the cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you. Very. And thank you for the uh, suggestion uh, that we put on an EVA international session in Sao Paulo. Um, it's a very strange uh, fact. It's a paradox, in fact, that during this uh, pandem pandemic, where we've all been locked up and secured in our our rooms, not able to communicate uh, in the normal way, that Eva has, um, if you like, emerged from its uh, cocoon, and there's been much more activity between the Evas worldwide during the pandemic than previously. Now, I do realize, Jim, that when you started the Evas in 1990, uh, with the, that very first event at Imperial College, they grew rapidly uh, because you found a wonderful form for enabling people to meet. And the big thing about EVAs is you, you get such a big cross-section of people for coming together to, dis to discuss a common interest. And that has remained a common denominator between all the EVAs, 200 or more EVAs that have happened since your very first one, um, Jim, in, uh, in London. And for instance, during this pandemic, I've, um, um, I've been to Florence um, and I've been back home in London a few times. But I've also traveled all the way around Europe, meeting people. Uh, who possibly I wouldn't have met uh, otherwise. It's a very strange fact of life that the pandemic has, in spite of all appearances, promoted international action. Um, so I think, uh, Paolo, you've, you've uh, uh, caught this idea at exactly the right time. Um, and I think between us, we've chosen a subject which is of huge interest worldwide. And the reason is that, to quote a cliche, we know the world will never be the same again after the, the, the pandemic. In other words, the way we can um, freely travel between countries and visit the museums in every town that, he, uh, that uh, we land in is going to be considerably reduced in the future. And of course, for galleries and museums, especially in North America, it's causing a huge problem because a lot of them depend on tourists entering their doors. That's the way they are financed. We're slightly bit luckier in the UK because there's free entry to many of our institutions, but this hasn't prevented um, a feeling and a movement towards wanting to share uh, art 
and artifacts rather than become the keepers of them. And this was a transition in thinking that was happening before the pandemic ever landed. Um, the, the pandemic has ex exacerbated um, at the thinking that was already in place um, before it struck. But it's because it's act, it, it has it exacerbated this situation that we're all here now and we want to actually try and find, if not answers, we want to try in some sort of direction where EVAs worldwide can actually maybe even assist in um, finding a way through um, the problem that might now affect culture and museums in the post-pandemic world. So we'll launch straight, straight into the conference or the seminar, whatever we like to call it. Um, I should say at the beginning that when, Paolo, you sent invitations out to people, um, I got a response from exactly those people. Um, I couldn't have named a better set of people um, to, in fact, give a few insights into, the, in, into this particular discussion. Um, I didn't have to use any persuasive techniques at all. Um, people just floated in. Uh, cyber-like, um, exactly um, as I wanted them to. So in that way, I thank you. Thank you very much for all offering to give your insights into this subject. I think um, many of you will, will know that Jonathan Bowen, who's going to be our first um, uh, speaker, um, is co-chair of the London Conference. And I'm going to tell him, as I will tell everybody else, that although um, you're all allowed 10 minutes. If you want to um, talk for less than that, that will be all the better. Because we will, as time develops in this discussion, we'll probably get short of time. We'll probably find time creeping up on us. And um, therefore, remember, in your contributions, less is more. And then after Jonathan's introduction and comments, he will move straight into introducing Tula Giannini um, uh, from uh, USA, from New York, who is professor at the Pratt Institute in New York. And I know in advance that she will bring music to my ears, quite literally, because she does play the flute, by foreseeing a bright future for those who know how to use digital to make art and engage with audiences. I think she's got a lot to say on that subject. And I completely share her belief in, in the skills of new media artists becoming an absolutely crucial component of our post-pandemic cultural life. In other words, I think their time has come. Uh, so Jonathan, if, if I could hand over to you and um, let you make a few comments. Thank you, uh, Terry. And I'll just try and share okay. my screen. Yeah. That's it. You've done it. Okay. Yeah, you've done it. Very nice. Well, well, welcome to everyone. It's very nice to see you here. As Terry says, it's a lot easier <laughs> not, not having to travel. Uh, and, and so there are some benefits, although obviously uh, you lose out on the other aspects like net networking and all those other things. Uh, but anyway, it's very nice to see everyone here. Uh, as Terry says, I, I'm one of the co-chairs for EVA London, uh, and I work with Tula, and we've been writing quite a lot on uh, museums and how COVID has been affecting museums and so on. So uh, the first half of this presentation is the, the, the boring bit, and then we'll move on to the exciting bit with Tula <laughs> halfway through. You can make the boring bit really fast. <laughs> yes, it, well, I, I'm going to whiz through some boring slides. <laughs> So, so this was a typical, uh, it, since I haven't gone out of Oxford, a lot of my examples are in Oxford. This is the Ash Ashmolean Museum during uh, COVID. It is open again now, but for a while it was in scaffolding. I guess they were mending it and uh, closed, etc. Uh, so here, here's some more pictures of that. That's the Museum of History of Science in Oxford. So they're making the most of the uh, medical situation we're in with nice pictures of 
uh, COVID. Uh, that's a picture from uh, New York where Tula is. Uh, again, uh, somebody's got a good sense of humor with the situation we're in. And uh, on the bottom uh, uh, left there, you can see uh, the Ashmolean. If you get past the, the closed sign, then you have to scan QR codes, wear a mask and all these other things to get in. in. Things are a bit better uh, now. Uh, but you used to have to book, et cetera, to get past the, uh, the guards on the front door. Uh, so I'm just going to present a little bit overview of uh, internationally what ICOM and UNESCO have been uh, doing, because ICOM is in charge of museums around the world. They, they produced two reports. Uh, one, the first one was in May last, last year, uh, and they had a lot of responses to a survey from uh, over 100 countries. Uh, just seeing how COVID was affecting those museums at that time. Uh, so at that time, you know, the vast majority of museums were closed. They just had to shut up shop. Uh, but that meant that, like we are here, museums were enhancing their digital activities. They were doing a lot more things online. So it accelerated that size of uh, museum activities. Uh, so over half museums were doing more, more social media things. You've got to remember that most museums are very small so all the museums you've heard of are the very tip of the iceberg with actually paying people to work for them a lot of museums just have volunteers nobody paid you know so it's very difficult to do a lot of these uh, more uh, exciting things but uh, social media i guess you can do for free and a lot of uh, museums were doing more of that uh most of the staff are having to work at home not quite as many as, as closed but anyway the vast majority of staff were working from home at that time uh, and sadly you know if you're a freelance staff a significant number were being laid off because of course freelance is a lot easier uh, to, to uh, lay off uh, and then they did a, a follow-up report in November last year uh, and here they, they still got 900 responses <laughs> response uh, well, this time uh, a lot of countries started having furlough schemes, including the UK. Uh, so a not insignificant number of uh, staff were on furlough, at least you know, not working for the museum, but at least getting paid. Uh, but as you can see, some of them were also laid off. Uh, <clears throat> so ac actually, well, that's the number between th those two dates. So it did go up slightly during that, uh, that time. Uh, again, museums were enhancing their digital activities uh, using social media still, so it was continuing much the same there, perhaps slightly less staff being laid off by this time, so a slight improvement on the uh, when the pandemic really hit. Uh, but, you know, a significant number of planning to downsize on permanent staff, uh, in a, and in particular, freelance staff. Uh, so I certainly know museums here where virtually everything has closed up. Unfortunately, you know, curatorial staff, if you're an independent museum, you don't really need curatorial staff because, you know, they're not making money. You need the people who are doing front of house, running the restaurant, the shop, all those other things uh, that, that bring in cash to museums. Uh, so they, they've got a good website. There's the URL at the bottom. So if you are a museum, you know, they're giving lots of recommendations of things to do, conserving your collection in COVID, because of course, whilst it's uh, in lockdown, you know, maybe that's a good time to get on with that sort of thing if you've got, if you can pay your staff to do it. There's also a big issue with security because you've got less staff on site. So you've got to make sure uh, that if you've got expensive objects, uh, you look after them well. Uh, they give guidance on you know, using social media, getting to your public, and so on. Uh, and how, how to, uh, you know, support your community because and a lot of museums will have two communities. There'll be the local community of people who can visit, but also, you know, you've got the potential with the internet of an international community. So things like uh, social media, you can reach anywhere in the world. Uh, and then, of course, what do you do when lockdown finishes? So it gives some advice on uh, bringing back your staff and the public, for that matter, to your museum. Uh, so you know. UNESCO had a similar report. They've got some pretty similar, you know, they did a similar survey with very similar statistics. You know, 90% closed, uh, going for an online presence. Uh, so 
well, they're obviously interested in places that don't have such good access online. And Africa, for instance, only has 5% of this time with online content. So there's a big digital divide depending on where you are in the world. And, you know, Africa's a very small number uh, of museums can be online. Uh, but there's a lar large number of museums. Uh, they, they reckon that the number of museums has actually gone up since 2012 quite a lot, whether they're able to count more because they're online and easier to count. I don't know. But anyway, the number of museums is increasing. Uh, and then they did a follow up earlier this year. Uh, so, you know, most have lost money compared to uh, pre pandemic. Oh, that's not unsurprising. 43% uh, closed in the first quarter of this year. Uh, there was strengthening links with communities. All these tie in with the ICOM. Uh, results uh, is also an, an opportunity to actually talk to other museums more because you've got email etc so there has been more inter-museum cooperation uh, helping each other and so on so that's a, a good good point at least uh, that sadly a lot lot of countries you know don't support their museums well we here big museums do get a lot of government support uh, but even if you've got you know, national institutions, a lot of places have been losing money because the government has said, right, we don't need to give you as much money because of the pandemic. Uh, and they reckon there's, I don't know whether the number of museums is going up or, or whether they've uh, just been able to count more, but, you know, over 100,000 museums. Uh, so that's a little survey of museums internationally online. I'll just do a little plug for Eva London. Uh, so if any of you are thinking to uh, write a paper, we're probably going to be a hybrid conference next year. Uh, we'll definitely be an online conference and provided uh, we're able to go to the BCS office in London, which is now at Moorgate, uh, we will have an online and uh, in-person uh, conference. So hopefully that will give the best of both worlds for people who can't get to London. Uh, so if you do want to write a proposal for a paper, the deadline is the 10th of January next year so there's now plenty of time to write something uh just this year for longer papers we're asking you to at least draft something because we've had problems in previous years when we've had a, a an abstract and then you know we, we don't know when you actually get to the full eight page paper maybe it hasn't been as good as it might have been so if you want to do a long contribution please do write as much as you can it doesn't have to be complete uh, that's the web address, so do log in and have all the information is put on there for submitting and so on. Uh, we do have a mailing list, so anyone who wants to subscribe to that, uh, that's where to go. Just type in GISC mail, EVA London, and that should find it. Uh, looking at EVA International, well, there's EVA Paris coming up next year as well. Uh, I don't have much, many details. They had to postpone because of the uh, pandemic, but hopefully that's going to be in April. And Florence is going to be in uh, June. And there is a submission deadline for that for uh, 20th of January. So do consider that as well. That's just a one day conference. Uh, and we, we maintain a website which has got links to all the EVA international information. So anyone who's doing EVA international things that isn't linked from this website, just send me the uh, the URL for, for your what you're doing and I'll make sure it's linked from here. And anyone who wants to know what's going on EVA internationally, that's where we tend to put the links. Uh, and again, there is a, a mail, anyone who's really interested in activities internationally, this is a slightly more private mailing list, uh, but just email me, that's my email address. Uh, so that, that's the email to send both if you want to join the mailing list and get a link added to the website. Uh, so Tula and I have been writing lots of papers on museums and COVID. Uh, so I guess our collaboration led up originally to this book in uh, pre-pandemic 2019 uh, and since then we've been doing a lot of museums and, and digital things uh, with and how the uh, covid pandemic has affected those so these are two papers we had in the last uh, eva london one of which was a symposium with lots of authors uh, and then we also submitted to the eva uh, florence conference and that's going to be a, a journal paper so it's already out as a preprint so that's the link there uh, i don't know if there's going to be a website to put slides uh, but i can put these slides somewhere either on the eva london 
site or if there's one for this EVA Brazil, I'm happy to give these slides for that. So that, that's the end of the boring bit. So now, now we change, <laughs> change tack. I haven't shown two of this because I thought thought she might like a little surprise. So, uh, so this is back back to uh, Oxford. So this is the Museum of Natural History in, in wow. Oxford. So we have this amazing sculpture of a COVID wow. thing, which is, is three, this is three D. We're wow. all done in layers, so you can sort of walk around it with amazing views. That looks fantastic. Three, three dimensional, all in the dark with uh, wow. all the spikes and so on, all just done on laminated pieces of, uh, I think, Perspex, or, or it may have been glass, but lots of layers. So I don't know if it's going so to go. Is, is it a digital thing? Well, I, th I think it may have been etched digitally. I mean, it's a real object. <laughs> uh, certainly it. producing it, you could imagine having an etching machine, because all those, <clears throat> each of these layers has the etching on it, and then it's lit up to light up the etched parts. So that's what you're seeing. Uh, and then, uh, well, now moving towards Tula, so <laughs> special <laughs> Tula colours. <laughs> so uh, this, this is now slightly more arty. This is a Tracy M, M in the uh, uh, oh, yes. uh, exhibit at the National Gallery. I, th I, can't, I think it's just, just pre-COVID. Uh, oh, but anyway, uh, yes, perhaps we aren't allowed to kiss anymore, but stay safe. <laughs> stay safe. <laughs> uh, and I'll... Uh, hand you over to Tula, who's going to do the more interesting part of the talk. No, no. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Jonathan, for presenting what you did. And uh, I decided that for all these different articles that you saw and in the book, I've been uh, inspired to write various poems that relate to the this subject matter. And uh, we're at a time when there's this in the museum world, a huge lacuna because with museums being closed, maybe they were waiting that they thought they had time. They didn't really have that much time because other things have moved in and filled that gap because there's the huge need. And one of those things that's been hugely successful has been the immersive, immersive uh, e exhibitions, particularly with Van Gogh and, and now Monet other artists and so museums realize that they can't go back to what they were and I, I personally think that digital art and education and participation of audiences this is where I think a lot of new things are going to be happening so poems for digital art and life is a collection of poems I now have uh, going back to actually, I think about 2014 to present. Most everything I'm going <clears> to <throat> read today is pretty much 20 or 2020 or 2021. And uh, these relate to these various articles. So for this first poem, COVID Commons, The Dream, you see that I picked this painting by Henri Rousseau, 1910. It was one of his last paintings. As, as, to illustrate something new that's coming up. You might have noticed that now Mark Zuckerberg's animation of a Russo jungle painting visualizes <clears throat> the metaverse. This is the next thing upcoming. And so I'm telling you now, time to create your avatar because everybody's gonna have to have this avatar. It used to be a second life, but now this is going into something quite new. So here's, these poems come out of joy, fear, all these different emotions that people are going through related to this COVID crisis <clears throat> and museums and human relationships. So alone at home, just my smartphone. What are my choices? TV voices, fake news, that's your muse, Netflix. Take your pics. Don't tweet or take the heat. You're in retreat. Escape from Amazon. End the marathon. Ask Google, where's life gone? Mickey and Minnie could be Winnie. A dream sequence with no evidence. Can't get back to reality stuck in virtuality. Main menu. No venue for physical experience. The materiality of holding hands, kissing, missing you. Okay, next. 
Zoom? Okay. Now, converging social and cultural movements, so interpopular culture, with the rise of TV, film, and video from the 1960s to today's screen culture. We look at screens 10 to 12 hours per day, some even more than that. So this is a kind of a screen crisis in life. And this uh, image on the screen is a section of a huge work that was displayed at the Whitney Museum as part of an exhibit called Pro Programming. And uh, it's, it's Nam June Paik's 1989 fin de siècle. And so this poem goes, <clears throat> relates to this notion of the screen. Looking at a screen silent and unseen, want to scream, can't move, I'm mesmerized, my mind paralyzed, my life unrealized, change the channel, no controller, feels bipolar, activism, Passism, passivism, prisms of the mind. I close my eyes. I see your face fading into the past. My cell phone rings. My heart beats fast. Wrong number. How long can this last? Looking into slumber. Look away from the screen. Dream, dream, dream. Next, please. <laughs> This isn't what you expected, is it? <laughs> <laughs> now, this is uh, one of my favorites, Inside Art. And this picture is from the uh, one of these Van Gogh immersive exhibitions, La Nuit Etoile, Starry Night. And it's at the Carrier des Lumières in France. And it was in France that this whole movement started with the Atelier des Lumières in Paris. And it's unexpectedly, at first they thought maybe it's a one-off, but it's taken, a, taken hold across the entire globe. There are many of these, there are two Van Gogh immersives in New York right now, and it's every, uh, in, from Dubai to London to Paris, we have these exhibits. And millions, literally millions of people have gone and they've paid good money. It's expensive. So museums can learn a lot from this, that, that audiences are willing to pay for this experience. So they don't just want to come and look. They want an experience. Inside art. I'm inside art. My eyes feel, my eyes filled with light of starry night, experiencing Van Gogh's world where images unfurl my mind expanding, safe landing into virtual reality. Surprised, hypnotized, so close to Van Gogh, don't want to let go. Sharing his life and emotions, mixed reality through digital notions of nature and art, don't want to depart. Van Gogh, you've stolen my heart. Okay. Next, and this is this is when, when people leave leave these exhibits. This is what they express. This is how they feel. So this is a uh, a poem that was inspired by one of our articles, but it relates to Alice in Wonderland and going down the rabbit hole. Yes, someone talking to me. Oh, okay. And uh, here on the on the left, you see an image from the Spanish surrealist painter Salvador Dali, often juxtaposed dream worlds with reality, thus making connections to our post-COVID world at the intersection of reality and digitality. And on the right, you see Alice distorted, kind of morphed identity. And that's from the original 1865. So there's almost a hundred years between the Salvador Dali illustrations and the original. The digital abyss. The past fades as we wade deep into a rabbit hole down under the grassy knoll of the digital abyss. Following Alice into Wonderland, take my hand entering remote identity in virtual reality. It's all a sham, can't recognize where I am. 
virtual life seems out of hand. <clears throat> Exhibitions and legacy systems of all traditions falling apart, canceled ambitions, new renditions disappearing, the past, the die is cast, can't hear your voice, no choice, times run out. So I think the important line here is all traditions falling apart, canceled ambitions. And I think we all kind of feel in this interim stage. Okay, next. Am I doing okay on time? Excellent. <laughs> Here, this is my last slide. Think of life as art. And uh, you can see there's some familiar figures here. Van Gogh, we were just talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, uh, this is a poem I just wrote last week. <laughs> and uh, in some ways you think things are getting better and then you can get very depressed about what's happening, especially with this new variant on the scene. That was my inspiration, this fear. You're always sort of fearing, oh no, lockdown's coming. COVID's back, we've been hacked, life under attack. Can't get back to where we were, COVID undeterred, vision blurred, morphed reality, more digitality. Protests in the street, can't defeat the disease, freeze, stop, please, sound the alarm, can't fight harm with harm. COVID, you've taken my breath, fearing sudden death, isolation, no rehabilitation. My heart is broken. No words spoken, rely on science, not compliance. Bad ideology, no theology, trying to survive, keep freedom alive. In the lockdowns, prisons of the heart, step back to reality, think of life as art. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tula. Thank you, Tula, for that very a poetic um, <laughs> introduction to our afternoon. Um, I, expected, I expected nothing less. Um, I, I think it's very interesting that you showed that uh, Van Gogh simulation of Starry Night, because um, I understand that in France, I mean, the pandemic has prevented me getting there at the moment, but there are exhibitions like that in Paris and at least two other locations in France where um, even though people can easily go to Quai d'Orsay and see the originals of all these pictures, they in fact flock to see these simulations. I think there's a lot to be learned from that. I, 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 I just want to point out one thing is that they're digital, but they're also physical and sculptural. Yes. They have a 3D presence. Yeah. And uh, this is this gives this immersive feeling of being inside art because yeah. you can surround us. It's, it's really a brilliant uh, idea and it overcomes the fear of doing something with these works that you're not trying to imitate the original, but you're using them as your inspiration. And so I agree. you're going to see more digital art that taking inspiration, you know, this, this is, yeah. you know, I think a pretty I big agree, to that. I think, I think there's a lot to, that can be learned from that. And the fact that these, they make such a popular uh, exhibition. Um, what I'm going to suggest now is that we go on to your introduction straight away to hear from the artists. Um, the title of a recent paper by Maureen Kendall and Fionn Gunn, it, the title itself says it all. An exploration of how artists use immersive technologies to promote inclusivity, diversity, and deep public engagement. Note the word deep, I think. Maureen and Fionn have all the in-depth experience necessary to explore <coughs> digital gallery development and how to build virtual worlds. So Maureen and Fionn, can, can we hear from you, please? Now, Afra has put a message uh, which we should all try and obey. 
when we're not talking, we should turn our microphones off uh, because that will prevent noise interference traveling around. So I'm now going to turn mine off and Maureen and Fion should turn theirs on. Okay, well, mine is on uh, and, and I, I was hoping that you managed to receive our, uh, our presentation through. Um, because otherwise I'm going to have to do a share screen and I haven't done that before on Google Meet. So, have you had it's, that? It's fairly easy if you've got it handy. <laughs> yes, I have. Okay. Right, so how do I do it then? Bottom middle, there should be a little box with an up arrow in it. Saying with present an up arrow. Now. Yes. Not dissimilar to uh, Zoom. Great. Okay. Uh, I'll go with my entire screen, I think. Yeah. And. Right. So that's a bit tricky because I can't work out. Hang on. Yeah. Just a minute. You need uh, to be displaying it in a window or a screen somewhere. Right. Of course. Like Yes, but it's not online. Sorry, Maureen, is there? Could you give me a hand with this? Maureen, put your mic on. Yeah, hang on. It's not. I've got. I've got it up, but. Uh, no. Sorry. Can you see this slide now? Hello? Not Is this yet, working? no. All right. No, we can't okay. see it. You can see it? No, we cannot. Oh, right, okay. Um, then I just, yeah, I've, I, I can't actually do it. Sorry. <sighs> um, well, I mean, in the absence of any visual materials... There we go. Oh. Maureen's presenting it. Oh, thank God for that. Okay. <laughs> um, right, just let me get out of this. Okay, so my apologies, and here we are. So Maureen, wonderful. Okay, so if we start right at the very beginning. So um, so this is us. I mean, we're a Maze Artist Collective, and um, the project name is Boundless Worlds in Flux. So actually, there's an, another group of artists here who are Flux artists. So we're obviously all thinking along the same page. Mm -hmm. Next, Maureen. Great. And and this is the stage we're at at the moment where at the, we've currently got an institutional partner with the Victoria Gallery and Museum, which is at the University of London in Liverpool. But we're looking for other partners on a sort of more global stage as well, because there are lots of um, interesting, I think, opportunities for us to collaborate. Um, these are our details, and I'll flag them again at the end of the presentation. So next slide. No, maybe it's timed. So um, really, we, we've noticed, and this is, this is our group, so we, we really wanted to go for not just diversity for the sake of diversity, but diversity for the sake of having really um, different perspectives on things, because this is how you build in resilience. And this is why actually those in the cultural sector that have suffered the worst during COVID, it is because they've been in silos. So we're, we're really getting past that. Next um, slide, Maureen. Um, and as you can see, we're, we're women led, and we're very diverse. We've got all ages. People are based in different places. We've got one artist in America at the moment, another artist who's living in Paris, but is of, is Taiwanese. So we, we, we have a common language of English just about. Next um, slide, Maureen. And this is just the sort of visuals on the piece that we're working on at the moment. And you can see this is the boundless hub and we'll see more images of this as we move on. Next slide, Maureen. And we, yes, the collaboration 
came out of the COVID um, situation, which, you know, I echo absolutely what Terry said. Um, it was a terrible time, but it was also maybe the best of times. And um, we, we, we did get together in very serious ways and, and had wonderful and very profound contacts. Um, that's a, an aerial view of the participant space, which is in our hub. Next um, slide, Maureen. And, and these are the kinds of themes that have come up for us, um, you know, displacement, migration, um, and, and this, how we connect the virtual world with um, the real world. So we're looking at, at blended experiences, and this is something that we see as the future, in a sense, of that blending of the physical and the intangible. Next, Maureen. There's our hub. And if you keep going quite quickly through these images, Maureen, we'll just write. So we're proposing at the moment we're we're constructing this virtual interactive gallery and um, you enter into the hub and you can travel backwards and forwards into different artist spaces between the spaces and into a participant space. And this is a key factor for what we're creating, because the participant space is somewhere where you can co-create and so the visitor enters into our hub. Um, and this is all just being created at the moment. So, I mean, we, we did all the visuals and the individual artist worlds, but now we're putting it together and building it in Unity. So next slide, great. But along with the actual sort of artist space, um, gallery, museum, whatever you like to call it, we're also creating a navigational system which can be replicated so in theory you could have many different spaces that would use that navigational system and this is where it could be very interesting for museums as partners and this is what we're looking at um, and these are the sort of again we're we're exploring the planet ecology all the sort of zeitgeist themes really are the things that obsess us and as we're building it in unity and of co course because it's a collage of different techniques and technologies, we're encountering all kinds of, you know, basic problems and we're getting past them. So it's been a great learning experience inside the hub. Yeah. On to the next one, Maureen. And you can see we, we sort of, we want to get that texture as well. We don't want just a sort of bland sort of, not necessarily a gaming feel to it. We want to create something that has real sort of a, a feel for the artist's physical practice as well as their digital practice. Next, yeah. So Maureen, over to you. And, oh, Mike. Right, so this is showing the MVP meetings that we have where we sit around and we discuss and travel through the spaces and work out how we're going to make them work. Maureen. Have you got your mic? No, silent. No, we can't hear you. Okay, do you want to move on then? So this is the theme of, of Maureen's and Maureen is, is very inspired by the sort of pool landscape and the visitor exploring beach paintings etched into the cliffs with beavers. And of course, that's very much part of sort of climactic restitution, uh, combating the rising sea levels. So if you'd like to move through your images. You can see and you see the bubbles as well that appear in Maureen's images. That's how you can transition from one space to another. So the visitor, as they approach the bubble, can touch the bubble and move into the artist space as indicated in the icons in the bubble. Okay, next. Great. And so you've got that feeling of landscape moving now into a, a seascape, underwater scape with Chen Mei Tsen's work. And again, this is us sitting around working out all the glitches with playing videos in Unity. So next slide. And, and Mei Tsen, who is Taiwanese, lives in Paris and, and sees herself as a bit of a nomad as well. Uh, and so very much connects with the whole jellyfish um, theme, which again has big sort of climate links as well. Next. Maureen, and we travel through Made Sense Space, and she's got three identical spaces with all the videos running of the jellyfish. And she's chosen red, blue, and black to, to immerse the visitor. All the little bubbles can be accessed, and 
the viewer can move in different ways. This is the space that I've created. And you can see we're all sitting around uh, having a look at that. And that caused headaches because it was imported from tilt brush and had to be optimized and it was crazy. So next, next slide, Maureen. So yes, so I've created this helter skelter, lots of different helter skelters that intersect. Uh, the voyage of discovery is for the visitor to go around. Sometimes they reach a point where they can read a story or they can listen to something or they see an exhibition within the rocks. So it's very much a mixture of all different kinds of media together. Next. OK, Maureen. Yep. Yeah. And so these are the images of my space with a central planet in the middle. Right. And now we're on to Nazia, Nazia Pavez, who um, is of Pakistani origin, brought up in Britain and lives in America now, works there. And she's created, she was very much inspired by, um, by an artist who brought an actual wheat field to New York back in the 80s. So if we go to the next slide. So her, her title is Displacement. And it is this idea, the visitor traveling through the wheat and almost feeling the wheat in your face as you're passing through because they're moving. And so it's that strange mix of something that is so rural in the middle of an urban environment. Next, Maureen. Uh, Fion, I just want to sure. hold you for one second because I've got to ask Afra a question. Afra, are you okay to stay until 10 past six? Oliver? Yes. That is fine, yeah. Harry. Yes. I the thing is, I know you're not going to stay. Sorry, I just wanted to check, Fiona. Sure, please no, 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 no problem at all. No problem. Please continue. Yeah. Okay, so we'll move on. Sorry, June. Yeah, great. So you get your, it's the early stages. This is Terry Broughton. She was the youngest artist in the group. And, um, and she's created, again, using different kinds of technology. So Nazi has been using Photoshop and Unity. Um, Terry's been using Maya, I've been using Tilt Brush, Maureen's been using Unity. So it's a complete blend of different things. And hers is an underwater scene. So again, we sort of keep coming back to these themes of, of water and movement um, and, and the natural sort of life cycle. So yeah, she's got an underwater scene and we see, and I apologize for the quality of the images. We've had problems with navigating her space and taking photographs and getting them to the right people. But it gives you a sort of an idea uh, of what she's she's trying to create. That fish in the background chases another one and eats it, you know. So on to the next one. And here's the participant space. And so we thought we'd create, and again, this is created in Tiltbrush, a, um, a forest of transformation. So uh, we can move on, Maureen and look at the space. So in this forest of trees, and we're building in the interactions at the moment, uh, it'll be very simple to start with, but as the visitor moves through, they can change the colors of the trees and the landscape that surrounds them. So they go from spring, summer, winter, autumn, and can travel around. And we will add in much greater complexity later. At the moment, we'll have sound triggers as well, bird song things like this, but in, in quite a subtle and gentle way. And eventually we hope that this space here will be one where visitors can actually make stuff. They can make their own trees. They can make their trees blossom. They can I, do all I kinds think, of things. Fionn, if you wouldn't mind, we should conclude soon. Of course. And so this is it. We'd, we'd love you to contact us. Next slide. Okay. Um, more in, we've got lots of educational perspectives on what we're doing and um, and our contact details again. Thank you so, very much. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Well, it, the, those images were absolutely wonderful, um, and I think um, you've you've proved the point very adequately that uh, visitors don't expect a simulation of a gallery That's visit not. on screen. Yeah. They're looking for something much more, uh, something which can take them to a, a more illusionary set of places. And you've proved that very beautifully, Fionn. Um, it, 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 as you say, it's an amazing set of work. Um, I'm moving now, continuing with our artists uh, who are gathered here together. I'm moving on um, to Oliver Gingrich and Afra Shemza. Um, 
And they are the two founders, or two of the three founders, of Flux Artists, which is a forum for pioneering new media artists in the UK and further afield. In other words, we, 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 you can tell from what Leon uh, has said and what Ashley is now going to talk about, that there's a number of these collectives that are beginning to produce um, work for what I will call the new heritage age. Um, I've attended many events put on by Flux, and they're always absolutely intriguing. Um, and I think it's best that I don't talk much about them now. But I have asked um, Afra and Oliver to talk very specifically about the research work they're doing with National Gallery X in London, because it, it's all pointing to the fact that it's not just artists that are moving to the future. Some of our institutes and museums have already um, taken note of the fact that they've got to change that they're not just keepers of art, uh, as traditionally they thought their role was, but they're now sharers of art. I think better to talk about this than Afra and Oliver. Thank you, thank you so much, Terry. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. It was also great to hear from Fionn and Maureen to hear about their work with Amaze and to see some of these beautiful images. Um, yeah, my name is Olive Gingrich. I'm co-founder of Art in Flux. I'm a media artist myself and a researcher. I'm focusing on mixed reality, visual sound, and neuro art in my practice. And here you can see some images of my work. Together with the Art Collective and Alema Group, I'm focusing specifically on visual sound. And as a researcher, I'm investigating participatory art practices at the National Center for Computer Animation at Bournemouth University. I'm working at Greenwich University and at Roehampton University. And I've just received an HIC research grant to continue this work on participatory art practices um, further. So yeah, but for those of you who don't um, know Flux, we were founded in 2016 by the artist Maria Almena Afrashamza, who is here today, and myself, and we're an artist-led community interest company. So we're um, specifically focusing on artists working on the intersection between art and technology. We founded Flux as a platform for artists, by artists for artists, and we've grown from 30 artists initially into 2000 plus practicing artists, from uh, various different fields, all working with different technologies. And what we've tried to do with Art and Flux is to create a platform ready for media artists to work with larger institutions also. Larry mentioned we've been working with the National Gallery quite a bit, and we'll tell you a bit about the events that we've been putting on um, with National Gallery X uh, specifically. Yeah, I'd like to share briefly some of the other events that we're doing with Flux um, over the course of the year. So the socials are our more intimate, more supportive environments for our media arts community. They're focusing on networks and collaboration and the mutual support network. And we have larger curated talk events that allows to bring some of the key themes of, in the media arts to the general public. And for these events, we've initially partnered with organizations such as the Royal College of Art, ESA London, Central St. Martins, and EVA London. And um, now I'm going to hand over to Aprishan to tell you a bit more about the work we've been doing with Art and Flux and National Gallery X. Hi everybody, it's really great to be here. I hope that you can hear me. It's a bit tricky sharing slides and muting and unmuting, so hopefully you'll shout at me if there's anything wrong. Um, I'm Afra Shemza. I am a multimedia artist and director and curator at Art in Flux as well. Um, you can see some of my works here on the slides. I have a keen interest in modernism, my Islamic cultural heritage, creating art for all and advocating for a more sustainable practice. So just to continue our little introduction about um, Art in Flux, last year we were honoured um, to confirm the National Gallery X as our partner for our larger curated talks events. Um, in 2020, we curated three events focused on gender, health and well-being and heritage. And this year, we've actually created four events for the National Gallery, Reclaimed, which will go into a bit more um, the invisible transcendence and radical ecology. And all our past events can be found on our website um, and also the National Gallery website too. And we can share that a link in the chat for that. Our, we also run workshops and we've been expanding to do online workshops. So artists teaching um, other artists or the public about how to create light sculptures, um, painting with code and creating wearable tech, etc. And Flux also 
creates and curates exhibitions. So we profile um, groundbreaking media artists and our first exhibition in 2018 um, turned into a bit of a small festival. And in 2019, we co-curated the Event 2 exhibition um, in collaboration with the Computer Arts Society and EBA London and the Royal College of Art. I'm now going to hand back over to Olive, um, who will talk a little bit more about um, Gender Tuck, which is a, an event that we did with the National Gallery, and then we'll talk about Reclaimed. Oh, I think you're on mute, Olive, love. Thank you. Sorry, my bad. So yeah, I was just about to say that Gender Tech was our very first online exhibition, and it um, yeah plays into what Terry was saying before about the need really to create completely different experiences. So this was our first foray, and we really wanted to um, specifically profile underrepresented groups in the media arts, including the LGBTQIA community. And um, with Gender Tech, we discussed gender in the context of our new media, profiling diverse artists from within the spectrum. Um, so we um, showed work by Jake Alves, Paul Greengrass, Paul Kinsley, Priscilla Burrell, Vicky de Hosea, some others that you can see here. Um, and it was really successful both as a talk, but also as a gallery, as an online gallery. But we also had to feel that we needed to do more and to really bring this virtual space to life. And that's what we've been doing with Reclaimed really. So back over to you, Afra. Thank you, Olive. Um, so, yes, so Reclaimed celebrates some of the most radical and innovative media artists of our times. Um, it, we're showcasing artists from the underrepresented spectra of society, an eclectic avant-garde of diversity, featuring women in tech, LGBTQIA+, and neurodiverse artists. So the exhibition and event was curated by the three Art in Flux co-founders, Olive Gingrich, Maria Almina and myself. And the exhibition featured 12 artists from the Art in Flux community. The show provides a virtual space um, for the visibility of diverse voices within the media arts. And globally accessible, um, it's really highlighting the eclectic and vibrant diversity. So it can certainly be said, and I know that we're talking a lot about institutions today, that potentially um, institutions within the UK lack, a lot, lack quite a lot where equal representation is taken into account. Very few minority ethnic groups are represented in their collections, programming and exhibitions, and even in their staff members. But things are changing. And institutions have had a really tough challenge with the pandemic happening because um, it's hard for larger inst cultural institutions to change and adapt quickly. And that was really what was needed in the pandemic. And so for institutions like the National Gallery to work with an artist led organization like us um, has been a really great way of being able to offer um, virtual and online program. So Art in, with Art in Flux being artist led, we are a very sort of small organization. So we are quite autonomous and we can adapt and change to the current climate that we find ourselves in from month to month. And so I think the collaboration between institutions and artists is a really exciting and really necessary one um, to kind of push innovative ideas out there. So for Reclaimed, we created a virtual exhibition environment and we borrowed some elements from the different institutions. So we, we stole the, the British Museum's roof, glass roof, which we created as a dome in our virtual exhibition space. And we placed our exhibition in Trafalgar Square outside the National Gallery in a 360 um, image. So you could see the National Gallery there. And what we were doing was reclaiming uh, public and institutional spaces for our media artists. So we focused on exhibiting neurodiverse artists, such as Natasha Trotman. Um, she exhibited Neuro Mnemonic, which was an interactive film work that explored the borderlands between the mainstream and neurovergent intangible spaces. And we also exhibited Aminda Verdi's work, who presented Exo Ex Exomatic Echoes, which was based on scans of her own medical data. 
We championed women in tech as well. So Camille Baker's work into her explores the internal worlds in context of post-reproductive diseases and the pain experienced by women over 40. In Daniel Braithwaite Shirley's interactive work, we are here because of those that are not. The artist that has archived the existence of a group of black trans people to highlight their lived experience. And this is shown as an interactive game that you can take part in. In Roe Greengrass and Maddie James's Down There the Sea Folk Lives, the artists explore male trans experiences in their film about gender transitioning and singing voices. And I'll now pass over to Olive, who'll introduce some of, some of his work. Yeah, so what was really exciting about Reclaimed was that the majority of the work was really interactive. And so you had this online space that you could traverse and that you can navigate, but then you also have 360. Uh, Olive, I'm sorry to interrupt. I had a request, it was on the chat. Yes. Would you mind speaking just a little more slowly? Uh, slowly. Of um, the Brazilian people. Thank you. Okay, absolutely. Yes, I Thank will talk slowly. Sorry so, to interrupt. Uh, no problem at all. Yeah, so um, what we tried to do with Reclaimed is really to create a space that you can explore and navigate through. And we featured 360 interactive artwork as much as other interactive artworks. One of these was the Pantheon of Queer Mythology by Enrique Agudo. Um, he narrated the stories of four deities representing existing issues for queer people in Western societies today. These issues might go unnoticed or are overlooked by mainstream culture, and here you can explore these interactively. And in Sharma Raman and my artwork, um, we explore gender fluid bodily experiences abstracted as a continuously changing representation of flow mental states. Um, here we see a 3D body scan that is then deformed and abstracted using brain waves, um, in this case our own brain waves that are um, basically distorted and then featured and can be experienced in reclaimed. Afra, back over to you. Thanks, Olive. Um, we, the Art in Flux co-founders, we also represented our work as part of the exhibition. So in mine and Stuart Batchelor's project, Shemza Digital, we asked the public to become actively involved in art making by creating their own digital paintings. And we also have invited the public to actually display and exhibit their work in our virtual space. So reclaiming these spaces for public participation. Kimatica's art piece, which is by Maria Almina, who's one of our third founder, um, Transcendence. It was an interdisciplinary art research project exploring how live performance and interactive technologies can induce altered states of consciousness. Yeah, and finally in Zeitgeist, uh, which is an artwork by myself and Sharma Raman, and uh, we use deep learning algorithms to indicate flow mental states um, that are basically states of heightened creativity to turn the artwork into an interface of creative collaboration. Flow um, can be um, simulated, and here you can both experience it as a 360 artwork, but you can also hear it and listen to it. So with Reclaimed, we wanted to show diversity across the media arts, focusing on diverse underrepresented groups. Um, yeah, we would like to thank Christopher McInnes, who was the designer um, of the um, virtual space, for his work in designing the exhibition and of course all of our fantastic artists for contributing. So Reclaimed, oh I'm not sure why that's white, okay great we've got it. Reclaimed was represented as um, part, it was launched at the National Gallery X in our Reclaimed Talks event where we invited three of the artists to come along and speak about their work um, and it was also presented at the Kensington and Chelsea Art Week and Ars Electronica Festival as well. So it's been doing the tours this year, which is great. And we're going to be continuing this theme of featuring and representing underrepresented groups um, at EDA London next year, where we're going to be having a physical exhibition at the, at the British Computer Society. Um, so that's really exciting and we'll keep you posted about that. And we can leave it there, I think. Um, and we'll drop some links in the chat so you can actually see more about the reclaimed exhibition. There's a lovely video that we did, which is like a tour of it. Um, so we'll do that now. Thank you, Oliver, Olive and Afra. I wondered if I could just ask you a question. It's, it's about 
National Gallery X. What are their ultimate ambitions? Because I mean, they're doing a lot of work through you and others at researching new techniques of um, illusionary uh, places to display artworks, not just uh, new media artworks, but traditional artworks too. Uh, where are they hoping to go as a result of this work? Um, it's always hard to speak for third parties who are not present. I think Ali Husseini, the co-director of National Gallery X, would probably love to answer this question directly. But my feeling is that uh, National Gallery X was really set up with this remit to explore the collection of the National Gallery through new technology and also through the eyes of a um, new generation of media artists. So um, there's really this... Um, these two aspects to create an, an online um, and, and digital studio as much as a, a physical recontextualization of the collection at the National Gallery. Um, I thought maybe you want to add something to this. Do you see yeah, them? So maybe we people? didn't. Sorry, sorry, Afra, carry on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> maybe we didn't um, say too much about exactly how we work with the National Gallery for the Curated Talks events, which I think is kind of interesting. So the National Gallery have a large collection of artworks and with when we're curating our talks we're looking at their um, historical works and looking for connections and links between curatorial connections and links between their collection and maybe things that we're exploring themes that we're exploring within our work as contemporary artists and then it's Flux's um, sort of responsibility rather than our artist speakers. We invite our artist speakers to come along, tell everybody about their work. And we also give the context of the National Gallery's collection. Um, so it, it kind of, uh, so we're thinking about it. So I just curated an event about called Radical Ecology. And so I was looking at artists who have been inspired by the environment. So Turner, for example. Um, and then thinking about um, sort of Monet's immersive uh, watercolours uh, with the, sorry, not watercolours, water lilies, mm -hmm. and how you can think of kind of immersive displays and those kind of ideas. Um, so you get a bit of a sense there in terms of uh, how, exactly how, practically how we connect the National Gallery's collection and to contemporary artists working today. Um, but you can see lots of the videos and things of those events on there. It's interesting you, meant, you mentioned uh, uh, Monet's water lilies because I read in The Guardian only the other day that in Toronto there is an uh, illusory representation of water lilies, of Monet's water lilies, in a gallery there. Uh, Ricardo, I know you're from Montreal rather than Toronto, but have you, have you discovered what that Toronto exhibit is all about? No, no, not really. I cannot tell you about that. Sorry. Okay, don't worry. It's just that I happened to pick it up the other day and I thought, well, there's a theme happening here. I mean, I think we, we, the, the, what we've heard from our artists so far shows that there is a definite direction and it's much more significant than that. It shows, I think, just the beginning of the ascendancy of what I call new media art. I know sometimes you just call it media art, but uh, I use the word new media art. There is an ascendancy, which there needs to be, because of course the traditional gallery can't really cope with it. And even the Turner Prize, um, the UK's main sort of prize in the art world, uh, this year, every uh, award was made to collectives of artists. Very interesting fact, is it not? You could imagine that it could be a made uh, an award made to Flux or to Amaze um, perfectly well, and you would have every chance of winning the turn prize. I suggest you go in for it next year. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to move fast because I told you time would catch up with us and it is doing just that. Um, we'll now move to Dr. Leela Moore. Now, her work focuses on the convergence of digital technologies and consciousness through emerging art forms. In other words, she's putting another slant on what Afra and Olive and Maureen and Fionn have already presented to us. Um, she's going to discuss Year Zero, Museums as Technoetic Time Machines. Now, by Year Zero, she means the pandemic outbreak, and I'll leave her to explain the term uh, technoetic time machines. Leela, over to you. 
Oh, microphone on, please, Leela. Microphone on. Microphone on. Leela. Microphone on. Do you see my slides? Lovely, lovely. Thank you. Yes? Yes, we saw a slide and we heard your voice. Okay, so you see the slides. Yes, okay. that's it. We've got a slide. Fine. Okay, one second, please. Please go. Yep, good. Okay, so hello. I'm an artist, filmmaker, and screen choreographer. I'm also a lecturer and theorist, especially uh, specializing uh, in technoetic arts. I also teach um, on online academic MSc programs by uh, the Alf Trust and Liverpool John Moores University. Um, the term year zero derives from a series of videos that I made in response to the corona pandemic during lockdown and which were shown in exhibitions created by FEM meeting women in art, science and technology such as acquired immunity and the fair meeting garden in house electronica lisbon i perceive i sorry i perceive year zero as the year that marks the corona pandemic outbreak our post corona age is not entirely free of the covid virus that continues to mutate via endless variants and like a virus art and design should mutate as well into numerous nodes and variations in a year zero's video i suggest that the fear of the virus is similar to the fear of radical innovations and of any form of other however since year zero we are pushed to think more and more outside the establishment box. In this case, the box could be a museum or an art gallery. Regardless of the existential fear of extinction that the pandemic engenders, we are compelled to think about the transmission of viral concepts. Moreover, as the world of human culture seems to be shifting, our perception of cultural heritage and historical time is shifting as well. The shift which is digitally and technologically based and orientated via telematic systems coincides with a cognitive shift, a global mind shift. As many artists, theorists, philosophers, and lay people noted the corona altered the perception of time and space through social distancing and intensive exposure to and participation in the experience of telepresence and cyberception finally the theories of cyberspace pioneers have been fully embodied experientially by all those who have internet access where, wherever they are in the world two years after the corona outbreak, most people are ready for the next stage of cultural transmission and reception via digital technologies and mixed reality situations involving physical and virtual level of experience. Thus, it seems inevitable to return to the technoetic notion of the museum or the gallery as brain, as brain mind or consciousness. During my reflection on year zero, I returned to Mary Shelley's novel, The Last Man. Lionel, the novel's protagonist, is possibly the last man on earth after a pandemic brought an end to most of humanity in 2100. Interestingly, Lionel spends many lonely days pondering about the remains and preservation of the world's cultural heritage. He leaves a message to an unknown future, which we can still receive 195 years after the publication of the book. Thinking ahead, who will pick up our messages or observe our cultural heritage in the year 2121? Unlike Lionel's historical era, our culture
our culture possesses complex tools and immersive technologies, but like Lionel, it may be wiser to think about the future now. Traditionally, museums uh, are storage houses for historical time and memory. The concept of the museum as a time machine includes both poles of past and future, with year zero as a metaphor for the present moment, the starting point of any experience of culture in space and time. The idea of a museum as a time machine recycles and extends the potential for a wormhole space-time tunnel experience of art and culture, a notion initially experimented with in All in Space by Sherry Rabinovich and Kit Galloway and envisioned and speculated by Roy Ascot in his paper, The Mind of the Museum. Fast forward to the present, our digital technologies, including artificial intelligence, are becoming so powerful that we need to be cautious about their ethical applications, which could have severe consequences on definitions and representations of cultural heritage. However, the fact that digital technologies and telematics are globally connected and currently shared like never before makes it not only possible, but also logical to think of the museum or the gallery as a brain or mind that is constantly active, responsive, interactive, and evolving. Um, the Kima Color Project uh, is something is a project that I really thought is in sort of stepping this right direction because I encounter videos by Kima in various digital online exhibitions, which extended the video's cultural reach beyond their point of origin in the National Gallery's collection, collections and paintings. I suggest developing further the interrelations between museums, artifacts and collections allowing access to more digital artists, designers, creators, to form creative interactions that could add digital layers, links, and nodes to any museum, extending its scope in time and space, and allowing it to be constantly evolving. The museum is thereby, the museum can thereby contain within its existing geographically based cultural structures, units that would function as mini wormholes that would allow telematic tunnels to form by connecting not only historical time, past with present, but potential futures via the perpetu perpetual interaction of different artists and their participating viewers. I have referred to Tula Gineni in another conference paper, an academic article um, in relation to the positive shift triggered by the Me Too movement and overall by what she calls real places of the mind that, um, that have the potential to allow unrepresented women artists and other marginal groups to become more involved and exhibit the work. In my previous um, two, uh, 2019 Eva paper, I proposed that some ancient tombs and museums are essentially technoetic time machines. They harness techniques and technologies to record, preserve, and, and demonstrate cultural and aesthetic experience by, by interacting with our perception and cognition of time. In fact, I presented uh, a few uh, proposals in different stages of progress for creative in various um, venues for creative interaction with museum artifacts and collections. And I and also there is the, um, the cyber performance component that I am currently, uh, I'm returning to via the Upstage platform, 
um, which is another exciting opportunity to link museums, galleries, and with remote performers and performances. So this is really something that I'm going to be concentrating in the near future, also working with my students. So, um, so the question is, how can you or we uh, make such collaboration happen or foster them? these wonderful collaborations between artists, museums, and their collections. That's when we... Leela, are you happy with just a few minutes more? Yeah, I'm almost finished. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm, 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 I'm fine. I'm just... Well, try, try and wind up now, if you can. I am, I am. This is exactly what I'm doing. That Thank you. Thank you. My last, my last slide. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. that's, that's when we think of the future, we already expect it to become the past. Moreover, our existential challenge to last forever as cultures in a post-corona world presents creative opportunities which correspond with a post-corona zeitgeist. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Lila, for that. I, I very much like your ideas, uh, museum as mind, which I believe you're saying will provide an enhanced experience uh, from a both both a participatory point of view and a, a apparitional point of view. I mean, I think um, yeah. I think you're posing a huge technological challenge there to make that a reality. Yes, but I think that we already have um, some realistic and possible ways to go about it. Really. I agree. Yeah, yeah. And this is the next stage. We just need to be able to, 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 to make these collaborations happen. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, if I'm right, um, Moshi Kane, who was going to be our next speaker, is not here. I'm just going to... Why do you say that I'm not here? Terry, why do you say that I'm not here? Oh, you're not here. You are here. I'm very, you are very here, much sorry. here. Very much so. I didn't see the name, you see. That was uh, my problem. I, I, I don't well understand. So Moshi, I'm okay, so, so glad to see you. Thank you yep, very much. Same here. Um, uh, I was going to introduce you just a little bit. Um, because really, following Leela's talk, um, I think it's time, and the challenge she poses to technology, it's it, it, it's time to move on from our artists um uh, just to touch on the subject of the sort of technological challenges that now we're all faced with um so i think this is where your specific expertise come in uh, in other words your digital imaging and the presentation of tangible cultural heritage you really are forging new methods of in fact um, um, investigating archaeological sites for instance and without actually um, the messy and sweaty digging process i believe your Im imaging techniques will create um, an illusion without without necessarily disturbing actual things in situ but i'm going to leave you to explain that very interesting concept. Well, well thank you very much, Terry, and thanks, everybody. Uh, yes, now for something kind of completely different, to quote a phrase. Um, I'm not an artist and I don't represent a museum, though I have been working with cultural heritage institutions for well over 30, 35 years. Academically and professionally, I'm involved in conservation imaging for art, for architecture, archaeology, etc. Now, usually in EVA meetings, which I've attended for some 20 years, if not more, hello James, um, usually in such meetings I present some project or another that I'm working on, but today is going to be different. In the context of today's meeting, I'd like to chat with you. Good. Not to show slides, to think aloud, to pick up on the challenge and relate to the title of this meeting. 
and to reflect on the way that I see possible way forward for cultural institutions and for academia in a post-pandemic world. I'd like to talk about what I personally regard as a potential positive shift in our collective mindset, which may hopefully take place in the wake of COVID. I'm talking about a shift in our focus from, from me to us, from insularity to diversity, from local to global, from issues affecting our own close circle, our group, our society, our institutions, our country, our religion, to those of the collective, to the world as a whole. The world has shrunk and that's not new. I think it was 1964 when Marshall McLuhan spoke of the global village. We know it, we've known it for a long, long time, but I'm not sure that it has ever really sunk in that we are all connected at the hip and that we must join forces in order to bring about change, in, indeed, in order to survive. We like to defend our secrets and our intellectual property behind firewalls and lawyers. We defend our borders with tanks and even with nuclear weapons. Yet all it takes is one little Chinese bat to break down our defenses. All it takes is one little Swedish girl to point out that the emperor is actually not wearing any clothes. All it takes is one tragic event to spark off global protest, Me Too, Black Lives Matter, etc. For decades, we've neglected and played down the warnings of global war, of economic bullying by the richer nations, of material waste, of climate change, CO2 emissions, and lately, of the dire prophecies of the medical profession in the wake of conspiracy theories. However, the past few years have brought home the message with such a vicious intensity that we can no longer ignore it. This double blow of, on the one hand, the pandemic, along with the unprecedented growing rate of natural disasters, have all sent a message that can no longer be ignored. And the message is, we are in this together. Together we rise and together we fall. And it's not just our health, our environment, our lives that are in danger, so too is our cultural heritage. And if we don't join hands to work together, we are lost and so is our heritage. Now, at the same time, it's not all doom and gloom. I think something good is happening also. We are all social creatures. We like our conferences. We like our meetings and our discussions. As an educator, I've always preferred the physical face-to-face -face meeting, as I believe do we all. However, the mindset shift that I am talking about and that I mentioned earlier is very apparent in the use of our online communication tools for meetings, for teaching, for conferences, Zoom, Google Meet, and so on. We no longer regard them as strange and awkward. We've learned not just to accept them, but also to use them to our advantage. Take this meeting, for example. A short while ago, it may have been impossible to arrange and carry out an international meeting such as this in such a short time. This would have most probably taken weeks, if not months, rather than days. Now, a case in point, which some of you here in the audience are familiar with, some years ago, I proposed to my college to establish an international course on digital imaging for heritage conservation. Everything was in place. We had a syllabus, timetables, teachers. However, it was ultimately deemed impractical, non-feasible, and it fell through. Then along came COVID and the impossible became possible. The non-feasible became 
perfectly practical. And in fact, exactly two months ago, we launched a course, a 19 week course with 19 different lectures from Israel and Europe, including some who are here amongst us this evening and some 50 students from all over the globe, Germany, Italy, England, the USA, Turkey, Cyprus, Holland, Norway, Israel, Argentina, Ukraine, even New Zealand. Now, the exchange of viewpoints, the multiplicity of cultural backgrounds, histories, religions, and the diverse breadth of knowledge that such a course is bringing out weekly could never have been matched by a narrow localized one, however good it may be. Therefore, I believe and hope that even if, and hopefully when, this plague passes over us, that things will not return to what they were before. I truly hope that we may learn the power and the advantage of talking as we rather than as me, that sharing knowledge freely and using the technology at our disposal for that purpose is a gift that we shouldn't lose. This message is relevant, in my opinion, to all, to museums, to academia, and to all institutions who believe in spreading knowledge and in the common course of safeguarding our tangible cultural heritage. That is all I wish to say, and thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you um, have introduced a note of great optimism. I thought you probably would, by the way, um, because that's my feeling too, that as time goes on, things will actually improve because of this rather um, difficult period that we've all been through. Uh, you've proved it in the case of your own uh, activities at your Haseda um, Academy in Jerusalem. Um, but I think in all our different ways, we are beginning to see a blue sky some way ahead with the sun shining there. It's no, longer, it's no longer going to be foggy all the time. And no longer is it foggy in London, by the way. It's all changed. It's, it's raining here today. Really <laughs> yeah. So um, I think we'll take your message to heart. Um, one point. How do you see Eva doing something about it? <laughs> oh, that's a good question, Terry. We've discussed this in the past <laughs> on many occasions. Haven't we haven't really yet reached? Well, I, I'm going to branch away now from kind of the, the, the theoretical and the ethical and let's talk practical. Yeah. Um, and I think the answer lies in Erasmus Plus, if you're mm -hmm. familiar with it. And I assume most of you are the EU initiatives for collaboration between institutions and academia. Um, I personally have got rather involved in it in the last few months. Okay. And I know, again, I think very much in wake of what's been happening the world over. And this feeling which I didn't invent, I think it is there, that we have to kind of come together and that the technology has become such that there's absolutely no reason not to. Mm -hmm. Admittedly, I mean, I missed the glass of wine at the end of the evening, but I can do that at home also. But so I think that um, institutions or organizations like the Erasmus Plus or the Tempus uh, 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 European Union organizations, which support both financially and logistically uh, collaborative um, interactions between organizations, institutions, primarily academia, but not just. I think that is the way that we have to push forward. We discussed this at the time, and I'm personally pursuing it at the moment in a very active way. And I very much hope and believe that maybe we will be able to get the support to, uh, to, to kind of bring Eva into this as part of the whole uh, support system and uh, not just kind of have this framework of EVA conferences, but actual workshops where we can all get together, uh, preferably physically, I mean, very much so, um, following this uh, international course that we're running at the moment, 
uh, which is going to take some four months, we're hoping very much to put together a conference on the same topic. And I would like it to be a physical conference and not a, not a uh, um, digital one, have it in Jerusalem and kind of mix in with lots of practical tours and so on and so forth. So I'm extending an, an invitation. And I know that people like uh, uh, Susan, who is here, and uh, Dov, I noticed also amongst us here, yes. will all support such an initiative. Thank you, Moshe. Um, I'm going to stop myself asking you further questions because I'm, I've got my eye on the time, as you know. And uh, Ricardo has been waiting very patiently. He's come all the way from, <laughs> he's come all the way from Montreal. Um, and it, I'm delighted to see him here. Um, Ricardo and I first met one another in Brasilia. Now, I'm harking back to those grand old days now when we went to conferences and we flew all over the world. And I've met Ricardo in Brasilia, in Colombia, and more mundanely, Plymouth, UK. But that does prove a point, doesn't it? Um, the Brasilia conference was all about visual music which is my particular form of new media art. Um, it's the reason why I am, along with Afra and um, Olive, I'm, I'm a flux artist. Uh, and, and my medium is making music visual. Some people believe in that as an ambition. I do fervently, and some people don't. Um, now, Ricardo, I won't say any more. That's just how we first met. Since then, you've been responsible for a huge number of events, um, balance, unbalanced conferences being only two of them, or three of them, or four of them. Please take the stage for a moment. Thank you so much, uh, Terry. Yeah, I'm very glad to be here. Um, well, let me share the screen. Um, I'm. Uh, let's see if I can do it. Yes, let's go. Uh, I hope you can see it now, right? Yeah. I think that this time I'm not going to talk uh, about visual music and I'm not going to talk about balance and balance that is usually about electronic media arts and, and the environment. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm thankful that uh, my colleague presenting just a few minutes before, I think that at the end of this presentation, we are going to see that there are some connections, I hope. I mean, but I'm going to talk about something I'm not really, I'm not usually talking about, but uh, yes, I'm used to live in, in, I'm living in Canada, I'm from Argentina, but I'm now in Colombia because I, I needed to take some air and I came here. So, um, well, why I'm saying that? Because I think that the um, international perspective, I mean, different views are very important for this, uh, questions that you were posing, Terry. I mean, when I was reading this in the post-pandemic world, what happens to culture? Uh, cultural institutions say new opportunities for advancement or suffer decline. Well, we are not completely sure, for, but um, I think that there will be a mix of things. I mean, with things up and down, but what I really think is that this is an opportunity to make some maybe small changes like uh, my colleague was saying, going from our to collective. Um, so I started to think about the links between uh, museums and power and politics. And I started to look uh, and search things about museums and power and museums and politics, et cetera, et cetera. And I found that most of the material I was finding on the web were coming from certain countries. Uh, so I found, a lot of material like what is the future of the museum, what is the future of museums, again, Center for the Future of Museums, and more and more and more. Then I found this publication from uh, Portugal talking about museum discourse and power. This is from a few years ago. Throughout their history, museums have established discourses about the cultural significance of their collections to the selection, reception, classification, cataloging, and exhibition of objects. These discourses were, and still are, 
determinant for the creation of collective memories as well as for establishing the ways in which societies deal with the past in the present. And my main point here is they also contribute actively to shape social, moral, political, and ideological values. By doing so, museums were and are not only institutions of power, but also instruments of power. So still looking around, I was finding more and more and more about what is the future of museums. And this is from this year, for example, February of 2021. And then I found this from the Journal of Museum uh, Ethnography saying, there is nothing new about museums having political implications. The first public museum opened amidst headed debates regarding democratic access to valuable collections. However, increasingly museums have become one of the arenas or in some instances, battlegrounds for debates regarding cultural representation. Why I'm bringing this? Because I think that, um, of course, I mean, museums and the, what we hear more and more and more about post-colonialism and what will happen in the future, I think that the situation is clearly different in places like certain countries of Europe, North America, and it's different like in places like Latin America in general, and many other places around the world. I'm mentioning Latin America because I'm going to give an example. My example is, who knows the museum of tomorrow? Uh, well, I'm not going to wait for the answer now, but I mean, I took this picture in Rio de Janeiro a few years ago, and this is an unbelievable museum in Rio. Um, my point is, would it be the same if this museum were in Paris, London, Rome, Los Angeles, Berlin, New York City. I mean, why we know about certain things happening in certain places and we have no idea about certain things happening in other places. So uh, if we take some of these um, just definitions I found in the web about the policy of, I mean, this is about uh, colonialism and imperialism. Um, for example, a policy or ideology of extending the rule over people and other countries for extending political and economic access, power and control, often through employing hard power, but also soft power. So my point basically is, um, these are also all photos from the Museum of Tomorrow, the Museo de Amaña in Rio de Janeiro. So my point is, yes, about the people coming back to, to museum or other ways of uh, presenting what we usually have in a museum. But uh, what I'm doing here is not a complaint, it's an observation and maybe I could call it an invitation because I think that there are more than one way of understanding the world and life, uh, more than one cosmology. I learned that directing projects in Cusco, for example, in, the, in Peru, or the consideration of a transdisciplinary approach. What this means is basically that uh, if this museum would be probably in another capital in some places in the world, will be as well, will be as known as the Eiffel Tower. But I don't know how many of the people who is not from Brazil uh, knows a place like this, or at least a photo of this place, or what it means, this place. So this is just an example of what I find, how things are working, and I think we have an opportunity to make uh, changes. So in a post-pandemic uh, world, I would hope that, um, for example, not only uh, before colonialism was in a certain way. Today, there are a lot of people talking about post-colonialism, but what is uh, surprising to me is that most of the things I'm reading about post-colonialism are coming from the same people that before were doing colonialism. So why not other people talk, especially the people colonized for so many years, why cannot show the, what the situation was and is, so we can show and share and become maybe from our to the collective places like this one that we are showing here and many other things from cultural heritage. So that's, all the I want to say, and I hope this will be some kind of contribution and we can it is, consider it, this perspective. Thank you very much, Ricardo. It's interesting that um, I know that Museum of Tomorrow in Rio, and it's good. a very good 
it's, it's a museum which poses a question. Should it exist or shouldn't it? Because it's not saying all that much and it's a massive structure saying it. In other words, almost too much has been put into the I'm, I'm speaking as an architect shouldn't, by the way. Um, and the opposite extreme in Rio is the Crafts Museum. I think it's called Crab, which I'm sure you know well, Ricardo. And that is a wonderful museum. That teaches you everything about Brazil. Wonderful. And it teaches you through um, folk art. Just like the Santa Fe Museum of Folk Art teaches you uh, about folk art throughout the world. Alexander Girard's collection. I wouldn't want to lose that, those sort of museums for the world. They are wonderful. Um, now, I've been very unfair on our last speaker. Uh, I, I, I think he's probably going to accept his lot. Uh, Professor Ernest Edmonds uh, from De Montfort University in the UK. Now, we all know he has an encyclopedic knowledge on computer and digital art. And of course, he practice, he practices that art himself to great acclaim. And I've heard him speak on the subject in Hong Kong and London, and now in Sao Paulo. But we're not asking to speak on this subject today, <laughs> but he can if he feels like, because he doesn't actually do, he doesn't have to do what I say, but I'm giving him the unenviable task, if he wants to take it, of making some sense of what's happened so far this afternoon or this evening um, in this madly diverse EVA International Session. So, Ernest, would you mind picking up the reins at this point and either say exactly what you'd like to say about it or possibly try and find common denominators between what you've heard uh, today? Thank you, Terry. Um, what I'd like to do is say a few things about culture and museums in the post-pandemic world in the context of what we've just heard. We've heard so many interesting things and I've written down so many lovely phrases that matter a lot to me. Um, but maybe I can give, a, give an overview, coming at it from this point of view, which is something that's not been said, which is this, that, well, the culture isn't changing so much, it's the museums that are changing more. Most of what we've been talking about has been work that has been going on all the time, but is now much more prominent than it was before the pandemic. So in a way, what's happening is there's a change in the uh, cultural context in which we're all working. Um, well, what I've seen all of my life is that when new technologies appear, the old models are implemented in the new technologies. And it takes quite a long time before people start to take real advantage of those new technologies. And I think we can see, and people have mentioned this already, that um, very often the museums are not really taking full advantage of everything that they could Fortunately, today, we've heard quite a few examples of people taking great advantage of the new technologies in the new world we're in. Um, how can this be done? Well, the most important thing to most of us here, I think, is that the new media art, I'll use that phrase, uh, Terry, I don't know, you perhaps prefer you, me to say the media art, some people prefer to say the digital art, but the new media art is much more accepted by the museums who suddenly feel that they have to engage with it because we're in, quotes, a new media world. And so many opportunities have arisen that were not there before. And lots of things uh, are happening in that front. And it's thrilling to hear of many of those examples that we've heard today. What are some of the characteristics that we've heard about that matter most? And these are characteristics that are kind of new to this world. Well, 
participation, participation by the public, participative art, collaboration, being together, making things together. These are attributes that we see today that were not there really in the museums of the past very much. And let me just make a few examples because um, maybe before I do that, I should say one thing that we have the new art and the new activities and the new design methods relating to the new technology, but the museums still have the duty to hold, present and make available the old. Right? So that how do they do that? And how is that enhanced by the new technology? Actually, with difficulty, but participation and collaboration offers them a great opportunity. And I've seen some examples of this in some museums because instead of the model of the curator in the museum holding an object, presenting it to us and telling us what we should think about it, a new model is possible where the curator presents that object and seeks our opinion, our anecdotes, our knowledge. My grandmother had one of those and she used to do whatever and so on. And that instead of the museum providing information to the public in a one way street, the museum can collaborate with the public. Uh, gaining as much as it gives and making that available information available to the future. And for us, many of us today interested in interactive art, for example, the archiving of that work is very difficult and itself a challenge for the museums. But one of the things that we know that is very valuable is the collection of reports of the experience of interacting with that art. And the very technology that we're using today and the very technology that the museums are beginning to push forward as part of their post pandemic strategy enables them to gather that kind of information so that when they come to archive the sort of art that we've been hearing about from our artists today, they can add to it recordings of information provided by people who have experienced that art as a very important part of the archiving, even when they can't uh, store the work in a re presentable way, even if in 100 years time they cannot recreate the work, they can provide the information about what it was like to experience that work. So this is a very important change, a change that relates to the politics that Ricardo was talking about right that the museum becomes a collaborator with the public not a provider of information to the public and this is very important for us so i think that um what what we see is a great opportunity for all of us in the new media art world uh, because of all of a sudden we're taken notice of by the museums but just think about the past. We owe it to our history, not just to make new work that is inspired by a Van Gogh, but also to enable people to see and appreciate Van Gogh. Now, you can only do that by actually physically looking at the painting. A reproduction of a Van Gogh in a book or on a screen is not the same thing by any means. However, the new media can enable the museums to help us prepare for seeing the physical object and help us to unpick what we've seen afterwards and have information added and dialogue following on. So seeing the physical objects that are held by the museums and galleries doesn't disappear. We still need that availability and it's still extremely important. If we look at a canaletto on a screen or in a reproduction in a book, it can often look quite like a photograph. If we look at a canaletto physically in a gallery, we see that it is nothing whatsoever like a photograph and that distinction will remain. 
but much can be added around it through the new media. And so both the, the handling of new media by the galleries, the new media art by the galleries and the, what they do for the future, and the use of the new media to enhance our appreciation of the old, both can be changed dramatically in this way. And I think that very much of it is collaborative and it is participative. And I think maybe those two words are the words that came out today. Many people talked about this. The time machine that the museum is, is a time machine that can be enhanced greatly by collaboration and participation. And I think I summarise those two words really as the main things that I've got out of our uh, lovely presentations we've been listening to today. Terry. You're muted, Terry. Yeah. Could I just say one thing to, to uh, what Edward said? I, I think that was really wonderful. I just would say that there's always a tendency to think of an either or. And I think what's happening now is emerging, making the greatest possibilities. But I agree with you that the one exciting new thing that was we didn't have before was the artist in the midst of the museum as an essential. The technology in museums has been all this backroom stuff for databases and all of that. So this is a very new thing. And the participation is critical, but it's up to the museum to inspire the engagement. And that's the big challenge. And that's where the artists, the digital artists, I don't, can't think of any other person who can be more effective in doing this in ways that are so interesting and exciting to bring the public in if they want to engage. Because they come in, they don't know what to you walk into a museum. Where am I? What am I doing? And it's when you have this, this uh, built-in strategy and plan for that engagement at, on many levels, but where it's being led by artistic vision, then I think you really have something exciting and very new. I think and I certainly agree with that. I think <laughs> we, are, we are ending on a high, which is exactly where we want to be. Um, and uh, Ernie, thank you. You couldn't possibly have given a better summary. It was great. Yeah. But of course, you've gone much, you've gone much further than you summarizing. You forecast a wonderful future in, in which um, some of the artists who we love so much will have, if you like, the biggest possible canvas on which to paint their top, their technological images. And that'll be a wonderful event, which could happen because, as I say, the pandemic has ex exacerbated the speed at which change is happening. All this will happen probably much faster now than it ever would have done previously. So. I, this is time for conclusion, I'm afraid, because uh, and believe it or not, we've spent two hours here talking to one another, and it's been absolutely delightful. Um, it's been the easiest thing to moderate because everybody has um, um, produced such wonderful um, points to, and and talks on images, and every talk has sparked up something excellent happening in the next talk and so on. It remains for me to thank all of you who have contributed to this session and also to thank Paulo Martinez who uh, is responsible for being here to Sao Paulo and for Dov Weiner who acted as an intermediary between, if you like, uh, London and Sao Paulo. And he, he acted, he, he, he took that role uh, from Jerusalem. And where, where else should he be? Um, so this won't be the end of our EVA international sessions. Um, um, they get better and better. The projects get more and more interesting. Um, I look forward to seeing you all at another one. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. And Terry, you forgot to thank yourself. Thank you.
<laughs> Thank you very much. It's been great. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's lovely to see J Jim here as well. So. Oh, cool. yeah. Yes, sorry. Thank Jim. you very much. <laughs> we said we said a big hello to you at the beginning, and now we'll say an equally big goodbye and good luck at the end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. The number's 11. We have 11. <laughs> Nine. Nine. <laughs> <laughs> Eight. You should work for NASA. <laughs> <laughs> this is like hiding his farewell <laughs> Six. Six. <laughs> Maureen. Five. Four. 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 Vladimir. Okay, we have four people. A quartet. <laughs> That's four others. What we? Oh, four others. You're yes, right. it's still. That's twelve. Bring out your instruments now. Yes. <laughs> this is it. We have a. This is the post. Well, well, this is where you find out who isn't actually there at all because they haven't logged out. <laughs> Three. Let's see how this. It'll be down to an intimate nonette soon. <laughs> if, is this a three plus one, two, three, four, five, six? Eight. Oh. James is there. Jim. Yeah. Eduardo. Tiffany. <laughs> 